Thank you, Candice. Thank you all for joining. And I'm here today to talk to you all about security. And to kick this off, let's take the situation as an example. You're working on like a new feature or fixing some bugs. And as you're browsing your favorite developer news site, there's something in there about shift left security or maybe just shift left or you overheard somebody talking like within your organization about shifting left and you're wondering what does that even mean like it it doesn't make any sense and it just this is like another thing i need to know about now to be or to stay relevant in my job or what is this all about and that's going to be the context for today's talk and we're starting with some research and the research quickly yields some results like what becomes pretty clear that this is about, first of all, security already as the name suggested, but also it sounds like that this approach shifts a lot of the security work that usually happens towards like the, the end of the, the software development life cycle or like the closer we come to production um, earlier into the process. So maybe even as you're writing your code, you might be wondering or like thinking like, I mean, it's all fun and games, but also this sounds like a lot more work for me as a developer. And why should I, why should I care about this? Why, why should I take on so much more work, right? Um, and also you might be thinking like, does it need, does that mean I need to spend the next three months just heads down in books and online courses to learn security skills? Um, and it's just, so much more work and like what is the benefit of it like why why should i care about this that's like that's the thing like the to, to set the stage for all of this um before we answer or before i answer this question and we dig deeper into the details here let's change scenery for a moment um because there's as I was preparing for this talk, I found a story that was very similar to what we're talking about here and has had similar outcomes. And I think we can draw a lot of like lessons learned from that. And for that, I would like you to, or like, I'd like to invite you to a world um, where we're looking a bit closer at Windows, PowerShell, and testing. Um, this is all from an interview I found a while ago from a podcast. The, the link is below here, and I think it's also, also already in the chat um, if you'd like to listen to that. And what this is all about is um, the person who invited, uh, who invented PowerShell talked a bit about how, I mean, first of all, how PowerShell came to be, which is also an interesting story, but here in this case, um, what we're looking at is uh, Windows. And at the time, Windows had a three year release cycle. And this is, again, it's all second information but from this interview. But what they were explaining is that they were, they used to be on a three year release cycle for the longest time. And I still remember the times when you would get the, the latest Windows version, and then it would take a couple of years before you would get the next major release, right? Or at least like any meaningful or like bigger changes to it. Well, like now it seems like it's much more like on a rolling release or like smaller, like what I cut smaller releases every now and then. But at the time, Windows was on this, this three year cycle where in the first year we would sit down and plan. Second year, we would write the code for all these new features and changes. And then year three, uh, we're testing to make sure that everything works as expected, and then we'd go ship it off. Together with that, there was the general notion that from a developer's point of view, I'm writing my code, but then when it comes to testing, that's not my problem. That's a downstream issue or like, like a tester's issue, right? Like the people who are testing, their, their concern is like, oh, does this code actually compile or not? That's not my problem. And over time, what happened is that there were a lot of efforts uh, underway to ship versions of Windows Server that uh, would fit into smaller or like would run more resource efficiently. What that means is that 
the example they were giving is that the the regular Windows server would fit into a 10 gigabyte VHD at the time. And they wanted to ship a Windows version or Windows server version that only took up like a couple hundred megabytes, which I think in the end turned out to be the Windows Nano server. And PowerShell was supposed to be part of that release. But in order to cut down the, the, the footprint of that Windows version so drastically from 10 gigabytes to a couple hundred megabytes, you can imagine that a lot of stuff had to go. And part of that was that PowerShell suddenly, instead of using .NET Framework, uh, it had to run on or had to use the .NET Core Framework, or .NET Core Framework which I think at the time also like it meant like a drastic rewrite or like like it was a very big undertaking to to make that happen and as they were starting to to with this effort to make powershell compatible with dotnet core framework what happened is that a small group of people started working on this and they also realized we, we need to work in a bit different way as in that we need to get away from this three-year release cycle because this is not going to help us uh, achieving this goal which meant that instead of saying writing tests is something that or, or like testing in general is something i'm not concerned with as a developer now i'm required to write tests i'm required to write tests ahead of time before i even write my code um which at the time seemed to be a hard sell to a lot of developers because they were used to one way of working and suddenly somebody's coming in and tells them I'm going to change the way how you work in a very drastic way. And there was a lot of resistance. But what happened is over time that a small group started out and they were reaping the benefits of this pretty quickly because they could start to self-host their their test cycle, their, their yeah, like their test runs and all that their CACD uh, testing and all that they could self-host that within PowerShell overnight. And then also they got, got to show off more of the features to executives. And people around them were wondering suddenly, like, huh, seems they're making a lot of progress. And like, how come they get to demo to the executives on a regular basis? And like, how can I be a part of this? Which is another interesting set learning, or like a learning from, from the story that if you're making such a drastic change, um, you find a coalition of the willing, like a small group that, that's willing to do it the new way. And then over time, as you're showing results, then... Um, more and more people will join, even the ones who were criticizing this a lot over time or initially. Um, either way, like this new approach meant or like resulted in PowerShell being part of this new release. And also the result was that TDD or test-driven development is a common practice today for those teams, but also in general in the industry. Um, because if you're looking for a job right now or recently and you're looking at all the job descriptions, TDD is always mentioned there. And um, I'm pretty sure that within most software development teams these days, TDD is a well-known or like a best is considered a best practice. And if somebody was to say otherwise, I'm sure they would at least get some strange looks for that. Um, and I'm here today to to basically tell you that it's that we can take a lot of the like the lessons learned here as 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 I don't know we as developers were learning and understanding TDD how to in, in incorporate that into our daily workflow that we can do the same with security. But if you say but security is, is so different, um, I'm not so sure. Right? Is it really that different? I mean, granted, the, the scope with security work in general or IT security is much bigger, right? More for testing, we're concerned with like testing frameworks, like some techniques, how we, I don't know, how we test against an, like, an, like a third party API or something like that, or um, different types of tests. But the scope, the, the scope there is very, this is something you can learn within like a short time frame if you're really digging in. Or you might say with security, there's so much stuff out there and like so many things, so many different things are happening. Uh, that is vastly different. We can compare uh, apples to oranges here. Um, or I think 
yes, we can. We can we can make an effort, we can start at least. Security is something that will never be will never achieve to 100 percent right? And this is we could strive to to build a uh, an, a system that's as secure as possible, but we will never fix all the vulnerabilities or, or backdoors, or maybe not backdoors, but like holes and all that. Because there's there's always as we're always changing our systems, there's always um things that need need to be addressed. But then before we talk about specific yeah, like steps you can take. What should you care about all of this? Um, when you're wondering, like, what, why, why should I expand my horizon here? What's in it for me? Um, one of the things I'm a firm believer in is that as we're working in in software development or in IT operations or like in in this realm in general, the only way we can stay relevant and yeah, stay relevant is by by acquiring new skills over time, adding more tools to our tool belt or the, or the toolbox. And this already started when, when DevOps became more popular as more we as developers started to suddenly learn what it means to, to make production deployments or deployments in general. How do we automate a lot of that stuff? Um, and it boosted our, I don't know, I'm sure like it, it had a positive impact on on paychecks at the end of the day, but also when it came to getting a promotion. And that's the same here where today your CV might say you're a developer, but if you're putting in the effort now to learn these new, like as you're putting in the effort to learn security skills, maybe in a year from now, you'll be able to put in the title of a DevSecOps engineer, which might come with like a significant pay raise as well. So there's like all of these personal benefits, but then also on a more serious note, you want to stay out of the news, right? You don't you don't want to wake up in the morning and then um, find out that your company has been hacked and like lots of customer data stolen or something else something else happened and like um, and even maybe even to come and find out later on that this all happened because of something that could have been prevented easily. Um, I mean, that's always the thing, of course, right? But um, I think the the personal gains of this is significant. So now we talked a lot, talked a lot about like the why and all that, but how do we do this? How do we starting to shift left? And like, what, what does that actually mean? Um, and I teased it a bit before that uh, it means to at security practices earlier in the software development life cycle. And one of the foundations of like the, the building blocks for that is uh, using infrastructure as code. Um, if you're not super familiar with this, what that what it comes down to is instead of going into, for instance, the AWS console right now to, I don't know, spin up a bunch of new virtual machines to deploy something or a Kubernetes cluster or uh, Lambda functions or what have you, like instead of doing this all manually through the web interface, you're starting to automate this with tools like Terraform, Ansible, um, or I don't know, like this, I mean, there's a long list of tools you can use, right? Well, like Terraform is one of the most uh, prominent here, or like the most well-known. Um, and so instead of going into the web interface, you're starting to put this all into a Terraform config and then apply that and apply it through Terraform. The benefit it gives you is that suddenly your infrastructure becomes reproducible. So that if you have to set up a new environment for some reason or to test something, you can easily do that. You can easily reproduce your production environment um, to test something or like to fix a bug or things like that. And as you're adding this to version control, the same with our source code, um, like we get the same benefits, right? We we see who changed what, when, and I can roll back changes if something broke. Um, and then adding this to my C ideally also to my CI C D pipeline, which means um I automate away the, the rollout of new compute resources. And so the starting point for this is really 
we're applying what we learned, what we're doing, what we've been doing for software development for our code. We're applying the same skills and principles to infrastructure. And when we think about uh, CSD pipelines for code, right now we have we might have a build step where we're compiling, like if we're using a language that needs to we need to compile something. Um, we're running tests, and then at the end of the day, we're shipping an artifact, and we can all do all the same with infrastructure as code as well. And you might be wondering, so what does the testing step look like? And the testing step can be something like this, where we use a security scanner, and I'm using Trivi as an example here. Trivi is an open source tool um, that, that I think is pretty well known and, and used by a lot of organizations. And what this does is that it, like for instance, scans your Terraform code or like your configs in your repository and produces these kind of findings here. And, like, and these findings can vary from um, things like uh, misconfigurations, like um, I'm, I declared a security group for a virtual machine that accepts traffic on all ports from all addresses um, or uh, two permissive permissions for S3 buckets or databases, things like that, but also um, what we see down here in this example here is that it seems like we we're not you we're not configuring the we haven't configured the backup retention period in, in a meaningful way or like excuse me that gives us enough time to respond to an issue. Um, so there is a wide range of like things it or like scenarios that tools like these consider. And what's interesting is that we can well you might have thought before uh, security seems like it's it's like there's so much stuff to take in and um, it's hard to grasp, like if, if you're brand new to this. Um, we're making this, he, he, with steps like these, we're making this a like another uh, delivery problem similar to, or like the, the, we're, we're considering this as a, like another yeah, like delivery issue, software delivery issue. Because we figured it out for how we Build, test, and deliver code. We're going to do the same with our infrastructure definitions. And as soon as Trivi finds anything here, what you see in this example here, with uh, with a bunch of um, high severity findings and critical findings, um, we can configure it and I can GitHub Actions to say, as soon as you find any of these, fail the build, and then report uh, the the results to. The, I think the, the the security tab within GitHub, for instance, where we can then can come in and then understand, okay, what was found, and then can start triaging to say, okay, we're going to need to fix this, this, and this. This we're going to dismiss because it's not relevant for us, um, and then we're taking care of it. And we're doing it in the same way as we would do for, yeah, our software in general, right? Like if. I'm opening a pull request for a new feature and the build fails because some tests failed. Um, I know what to do. I know how to come in there and listen, okay, like test, like test one, two, three, four failed. I'm gonna go reproduce this locally, for instance, and start fixing it. And we're applying the same workflow here to fix security issues in, in the same way. Um, and this already answers a bit of the, the question around um or do I need to spend, really need to spend three months to to level up my skills before I can do anything? No, you don't have to. You can start today and integrate tools like these into your existing workflow and fix these issues as you go. Because as you see here, you get a very detailed explanation of what's wrong and also uh, pointers to how to fix this or what to do instead to to remediate situations like these. Um, the next one I'd like to introduce you to is, the next solution is Panoptica, which is coming from Cisco, from within Outshift. This is one of the products we're working on right now. And Panoptica um, is a CNAP solution. CNAP stands for Cloud Native Application Protection Platform. It's definitely a mouthful, um, but what it, comes down to is a collection of tools that 
are all focused on cloud security. Um, some of them are more focused on the uh, like how we're building or like, or like preventing issues before they go into production. And that's what we're going to look at in a second. And we also have a lot of capabilities around um, detecting uh, breaches or break-ins at runtime or detecting misconfigurations in productions and, and things like that. And so that's something we could talk about for like at least another hour, but then uh, to be respectful of time, we're only going to focus on the more on the CI/CD aspects of this. Or in this screenshot here, or in this this view here, um, we're seeing very similar results and findings to what I just talked about for the for Trivi in the previous slide. And it works the same way as your uh, connecting a GitHub repository or GitLab repository to Panoptica, and it starts scanning this on a on a regular basis. Um, and each scan might reveal security findings, as we'll see here. Like in this case, we have 215 findings, varying severities, like medium, low, um, but a lot of high findings. What we see here is uh, findings around uh, how we handle API keys or secrets in general, but it's very similar to what we've seen in the in the Trivi screenshot on the, on the Trivi slide. That. I can use this information here to catch misconfigurations and vulnerabilities before they even go into a test or staging environment or production for that matter. So I can drill down, understand exactly, okay, what did you find this? What's wrong? And then I can start uh, triaging or rem remediating the issue. The other aspect to that is what a feature that's currently in preview, which is gonna be shipping for everybody soon is the what we call CLCD posture, which looks not so much on like specific code, but more on uh, your repositories and your CLCD pipeline in general. Uh, what you see here as an example is, um, for instance, that you should enforce policies around uh, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication for organization members or the enforcement of code reviews before something gets merged and things like that. Um, and so this is giving you an another level of security on a on a on a yeah you know, on a different level, if you will, right? Making sure that all your repositories are configured in the right way. And again, this is all something that starts to happen gradually as your yeah, like you can incorporate workflows like these or information like this into your regular workflow as you're um, setting up new resources or as you're working on code. An applica gives you the information on, yeah, information and on what you can remediate as you're going along. And so this is something that you can, or it helps you to get into this on a step-by-step -step basis. To wrap things up, and leveling up your security skills is something I think is becoming more and more crucial. And having more tools on your tool belt, on your toolbox is going to help you as in your daily work, even if your main concern is not security. It still helps to be more confident in situations like um, when we think back like, like a thing like last year or like the year before, uh, one lock, one day lock for J vulnerability was disclosed. What are we going to do in situations like that? How do we handle that? How do we, first of all, determine if we're affected, but also how do we patch our systems? How can, and then how can we be more proactive about situations like that? Um, and <clears throat> if you think, or like if, if you're interested in learning more and like starting to learn more about um, like cloud native security or um, how to detect misconfigurations or CICD security, I'm inviting you to check out our academy. It's all free. And we have, uh, as you see here, like we, we have uh, video content on there. We have 
interactive modules or red team modules uh, that walk you through specific security scenarios, but also uh, courses on the topics I just mentioned. And we're, we're always adding new content to our catalog here. And that concludes our session for today. Back to the Linux Foundation. It looks like we got one question in the Q&A, if you want to take a look, or do you want me to read it out loud to you? Um, no, I'll, I'll take a look. Um, okay. So how does Panoptica com compare with Sneak? Um, so, so the question is, how do we, how does Panoptica compare with Sneak or does Sneak focus on different areas? I think, Right now, there's there are some areas where Sneak has like capabilities we don't have when it comes to the, I would say like anything around more like developer focus. But we're work, currently working on adding that as well. Like in the next few weeks and months, you will see more capabilities around integrating Panoptica into your development workflow more. Well, like right now, it's much more focused on the. I guess like the operations part of it, if that makes sense, right? Where you connect it to your AWS account and then you see, okay, what is what is happening in, for instance, in production right now? And then is there anything that needs attention? Um, I don't have like a like a like a bullet point by bullet point comparison for you right now, where we say like, oh, we, we do these two things, but Sneak does the, these other two things. Um, but you what you will see is that our focus will be much more on um, yeah, like this, this shift left approach, bringing Panoptica closer to uh, what's currently happening in like in, in development, right? If that makes sense. At least uh, uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, if there's anything else, or like if I can clarify anything, definitely let me know in the Q&A, like in the Q&A section. Like we don't have any more open questions. Um, yeah, if any, if yeah, anything else comes up, definitely find me on LinkedIn or reach out to other team members from Panoptica. And I'm definitely inviting you to check out our academy. Great. So it looks like um, oh, it looks like okay. we only got one more question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great question. What is the difference between Trivi and Panoptica? Trivi is a command line tool that focuses uh, exclusively on vulnerability scanning. Um, they have, I mean, they there's like different features or like different. Um, uh, there's like a few aspects to what what you can scan, like if. In the example you've seen earlier, what I've done is um, scanning a, like a Git repository, but you can also scan Docker images, and I think there's like a few other like things you can you can scan. But that that's the only that's the main focus of that. Like it's, it's a command line tool that you can either run locally or as part of your CI/CD pipeline. Or Panoptica is a first of all a SaaS application, so it's all web based, and gives you yeah like a, like a much more um what is the word a uh holistic view on on your cloud native environment what that means is that while we can also do the vulnerability scanning what trivi does that is just one aspect of the capabilities we have the other things we do are for instance attack path analysis or you can see, or like it, 
or Panoptica scans your AWS account or Google Cloud or Azure and can can show you based on like misconfiguration misconfigurations it found or um other vulnerabilities that this is how an attacker for instance can leverage this uh like publicly accessible EC2 instance to gain more privileges or how like can gain access to privileged data or sensitive data within your environment. Or otherwise you would have to sit down and, and do all of this yourself by just looking at yeah, looking at your account. An applicant can do a lot of this or automates a lot of this this kind of um I would almost say like detective work if that makes sense. So that you get to see at a glance, okay, are there any is there are there any like critical uh, vulnerabilities or security holes, if that makes sense, um, that need to need to be addressed. But also, if, for instance, we need to be uh, SOC two compliant, what are the? Well, you can see exactly these are like all the the controls for that or HIPAA compliance, for instance. And how well am I meeting these these controls right now? Or is there anything uh, that needs to be that that we need to work on to meet compliant to stay compliant in that sense? So it is a much more holistic view on your cloud infrastructure where Trivi only focuses on the the scanning of, of infrastructure as code yeah, bef before it goes into production. Um, I hope that answers your question. Fantastic. Everyone give everyone like one more minute to like ask mm -hmm. any questions. Yep. And then we can wrap up. Uh, see, we have another question. Is Panoptica open source too? Um, no, Panoptica is not open source. Um, Panoptica is a a paid product. Um, we do have a few open source uh, components, like, like smaller tools that are um, building blocks of Panoptica or like will be building blocks again. So because we, we, yeah, like we underwent like a bunch of changes the last year um and these are all like under the open like they're all called open clarity and i will put the links for you in the chat um and so uh so open clarity is a or a, it's like a collection of tools security tools that are um me so I just put the link to the website in the chat um if you'd like to check that out um so open clarity is an open source platform to for security and observability that has some of the capabilities that panoptica offers but panoptica builds or like enhances those with like, like a bunch more um like runtime monitoring and all that um 
And so we, we do have a free trial that you can check out. That, um, and also a, yeah, and, and like the main tier is like the paid tier for Panoptica. And then see like another question, um, what security rules are included, CIS benchmark or something else. Um, I assume this is for Panoptica and we do have, uh, like CIS is definitely on the list. Um, I'd have to double check what else what else we do include by default or like what, what else we consider or like taking into account when scanning. Um, and there's, and so this is, so there's code scanning on one side and then we also have, uh, yeah, like runtime compliance. That's what I would call it, right? All the compliance in general when, when we talk about GDPR, I think CIS is definitely on the list there. And then um, for instance, SOC 2 as well. I hope that that answers your question. Um, just got another question. Are there videos in the Academy about using Panoptica or to understand security in general? Um, the answer is both. So we're what we're doing right now is building content that introduces you to a lot of the what I'll call like the CNAP universe or like the CNAP realm. Um, what is there's a lot of different, yeah. Like I, I call it tools earlier. I think that's like a fair way of, of describing it, that we're focusing on explaining what these these aspects of CNAP are, but also um, what's going to happen soon is that we'll, we'll also have more content around um, security practices in general, right? And so there's there's going to be a lot of like text-based content, but we we'll also have, yeah, we're also adding more and more videos around uh, that as well. And so the content is both about showing how to use the product in certain cases, but also teaching you yeah, more general aspects of security works or excuse me, what you that are not product specific specific at all, or showing um open source products. So the for instance the, the trivia example I mentioned earlier is part of a course on infrastructure as code security, which will come out soon. Um and there you will see that it, it, of course, also showcases some Panoptica aspects, but it um, also showcases a lot of the, or like what open source tools you can use to to get started without having to, to spend money right away, for instance. Yep, you're welcome.
James, absolutely. Um, any more questions around the product or um, our academy or security in general? So it looks like there's no more questions. Do you want to go ahead? Are you ready to wrap up? Yep, I'm ready to wrap up. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, John, for your time today. And thank you everyone Absolutely. for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all. Bye.